Today on Sagittarian Matters, we discuss the life and art of Genevieve Castre with special guests Phil Elvram and Mariana Ritchie. Stay tuned. Geneviève Castré was a French-Canadian cartoonist, illustrator, and musician. She was the author of the books Susceptible, A Bubble, and more. She had art exhibitions around the world and toured musically under the names Opin and Wolf. Geneviève passed away on July 9, 2016, at the age of 35. She is one of my very favorite artists. Drawn and Quarterly just released her complete works, a giant, beautiful, hardbound book, that was organized, edited, and assembled by Genevieve's husband, Phil Elfram. Phil joined me to talk about Genevieve, their life together, and her collected works. You may recognize him from the bands Mount Erie or the Microphones. Now please enjoy my talk with Phil Elfram. Hi, Phil. Welcome to Sagittarian Matters. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank you. Yes, you too. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the welcome. I think I haven't seen you since you went on tour for your album. A crow looked at me where I was sobbing in the chapel where you played in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. But that was that in 2017? I think it was. Yeah, I was just <clears throat> I was just looking at those records just now actually for this other thing I'm I'm, work, I'm working on this like songwriting class right now and I today I have to work through like those those songs I'm going to like display them how I recorded them and so I was looking back through oh when did I record that what date was that but it, it's all a blur really I do have to refer to the the official record to like get the actual date cuz I think I was doing that tour in sort of a haze yeah yeah. Um, so that that was the record that you wrote after Genevieve passed away, uh, mm. just for people that haven't listened to it. And we're here to celebrate this giant 400 pound book <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you it's have put huge. together of her complete works. Is it 900 yeah. pages? <laughs> <laughs> it's 567 or something. Yeah. It's, it is uh, huge. It turned out to be giant. I did trim some stuff, believe it or not. Really? I did, yeah, I did, did leave some stuff out. When I was getting ready for this, I realized if I read that in bed, it would kill me. And so I had to pull out the smaller versions of her books that I had. Yeah, it's a book that needs like a special little um, cart with wheels on it. <laughs> a little uh, podium. Like, yeah, one of those little stands. Yeah. Where you put your giant encyclopedia. Um, I know you've answered this a trillion times, but can you tell listeners, how, or, or me, how you first met Genevieve and what your, what your concept was of her work when you first yeah. met? Well, I met her through the mail before meeting in person. I don't know if that counts, but that's where I first encountered her like aesthetic and her work. It was in, it was 20 years ago. Almost exactly, actually. I was living in Norway the winter of 2002-2003 by myself in this cabin, and I just got a letter in my little... I, yeah, I don't want to get too into my story, but like okay. I was living in this cabin, and I had to figure out how to receive mail by... I found a hollow stump, and I put a piece of plywood on top with my name on it. What? And <laughs> postal truck... Because I didn't have an address, I was just renting this cabin. So, like this, you know, mountain cabin down the trail. But I flagged down the mail truck and said, can I get mail? And what's my address? How do I do it? And they just said, just put your name on anything. <laughs> and they, that was my mailbox was a stump. And so 
I did start getting mail. Um, she sent me a really amazing package that winter of like her, some of her books. I forget even what it would have been. And a letter that was written on torn out pages of a copy of Be Here Now, the Ram Das, like, and it probably smelled like patchouli, but it wasn't her patchouli. It was like for this garage set. Anyway, the, her, it was this very potent, uh, introduction to her whole aesthetic, her, her mini comics, her squiggly handwriting. And it was like basically kind of a fan letter, but more like a friend letter. She knew some of my friends and like Kyle Field from Little Wings that she had met. She was living in Victoria and really passionate about like setting up shows and bringing people to Victoria, BC. So she, that, yeah, that was her excuse for writing to me was like, I like your music and also want to come here and play some shows. So you got the letter from the stump and then did you put a letter back in the stump for the male person to pick up and take to her? I think I didn't. Maybe I sent her a postcard. It didn't work for outgoing mail. I had to be down there by the road when he drove by and flag him down. And side thing, I didn't have stamps, but he had, I was like, um, sir, do you have stamps for sale in your little truck here? And he said, yes. And he had a little scale, that, like this little kind of brass thing he pulled out that he hung with his hands with like a counterweight. And he put my letter on one little dish. It was so like ancient times. <laughs> And then I gave him... My... It was only 20 years ago. Yeah. Norwegian coins for a couple of stamps to send this postcard to Canada. But yeah, anyway, I, I probably emailed her back more and said, yeah, I got your thing. You're amazing. I have heard of you. I had heard of her before that because people were like, Phil, you got to meet this person. You guys are going to love each other. And yeah, we did. And then you were inseparable. Yeah. It was pretty quick. It was pretty much like, ah, oh, dang it. Yeah, you're my person. Okay, well, let's change our lives and figure out how to be together somewhere. And you moved to Anacortes, Washington. And both of you, I'm interested to know what your work life was like together, like how you organized your days and how your creative practices kind of meshed or didn't mesh or mm -hmm. how it went. Yeah. Yeah, we were both really similar in that way. We're like super dedicated to our creative projects, music and art and making posters, but also pretty crusty about not wanting to collaborate or even show people what we're working on. So we both existed in separate parts of the house and met for meals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a work house. We didn't have other jobs. We were just like, surviving on art and you know yeah it was a workhouse for sure huge table like work tables with tons of things in progress stacked up everywhere we didn't have a kid or other job so yeah it was just work zone artist's house I loved it I mean it's still that's still my <laughs> that's still my house that's still how I like to do it and Still, those are still my priorities, although now I'm also raising a kid and I do value like um, having a nice clean table to sit down and eat food at. Oh, yeah, that's I do. I do have a table that's like set the separate table that doesn't have anything on it. Yeah. And then I'll eat on the couch. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. where I have piles of books and I, like things yeah, are yeah. stacked on the books. Yeah, yeah. Your middens. Yeah, so we that was basically what our life was like for 13 years or so in Anacortes. And lots of traveling, lots of touring and like music tours or she would do art exhibitions in different places or tie those into um, some music shows. Always just going for it. So along the way, she amassed, I'm going to imagine thousands of pages of drawings. Yeah, who knows? I mean... This book, I tried to be comprehensive, but she also sent so much stuff to friends all over the place that, and didn't keep a record of it, and I didn't really try that hard to track it all down. So there's a lot of stuff out there in the world that isn't in this book hmm. that, yeah, but I did my best. I kind of want to go back and forth because I'm, 
I mean, I guess I, I want to know. Well, so I want to tell people. So she got very sick with cancer and over the course of 14 months, um, she went down. She yeah. went downhill. Yeah, um, yeah, it was it was quick. So your daughter was born, and then shortly thereafter, she was diagnosed with a pancreatic cancer. Um, and I, I was talking to our friend Richie. She, she said, I think you should ask Phil about how Genevieve was drawing until the very last. Yeah. Until, like, way past when the hospice people said she should be not even conscious. She was up and drawing. Yeah. No, that's, that's sort of like an emblematic image of her, of like who, who she was. It was so, uh, like life or death or something for her, the, the ability to ha- draw. And I sort of what I tried to show in the, putting this book together was how it seemed like that started when she was a little kid. There's pictures of her at her drawing desk when she was like, I don't know, five or something. And it looks the same. It's just like stacks of stuff, like any kid's messy drawing desk. But just that she remained with that in all of the different punk houses she lived in and whatever. And then meeting me and all the different places we lived was this sort of same station was set up everywhere. And it was, I think, just an extension of her brain and her like being was the need to have this. Maybe it was like a place of safety or something or a place of, yeah, stability or... um, uh, world making I mean who knows why artists obsessively work on their art but for her for her it was um, she couldn't stop doing it and then I think as she maybe subconsciously saw death coming as she got sicker even though she didn't really want to acknowledge it or talk about it I'm sure she knew that it was coming it sort of sent her deeper into that zone of like I'm running out of time oh, I have so many ideas left I wanted to do um, w- must work harder. And she was, yeah, it was intense, but she was like on oxygen. So she had this oxygen machine and tubes into her nose and like coughing stuff up because her lungs were, I don't want to get too graphic, but yeah, she, her body was failing. And um, she was just still at her drawing desk, like desperately hunched over working on it. And it's like beautiful and also it's a little sad too just because she was um not there's an aspect to that that she was dissociating from reality or whatever it's fine I mean people see death coming they react in whatever way they react but that's what she did and she made a lot of stuff there at the very end well you know I I think I over, I was like, okay, I got to prepare for this talk with Phil and I'm not just going to cry at him, a person who actually experienced the grief firsthand for like an hour. But I think I almost over identify with her work because I have a similar sense of like safety in my practice Mm -hmm. of having grown up in a similar way and having that be the only like register of the truth mm-hmm. of things that were happening or of my experience yeah. to be like, I wrote it down. I drew it. Mm-hmm. And also getting to exist on the page yeah, or exist in that way. So it makes, you can, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, m- maybe, what you're getting at is that being able to draw something when you're in like a difficult situation, being able to write and draw yourself in it, your own story as a way of maybe trying to fix it or make sense of it and draw in an aspirational way. And I think that the work she made at the end was specifically this book, A Bubble, which was about a mom trapped in a bubble who can't relate to her child who's like not in the bubble the bubble was Genevieve's fixation on healing and she and on work and she just so badly wanted to like make it all go away and just go live life outside of this bubble and so at the end of that book the bubble pops and they 
hold hands and walk down away to uh, go get ice cream. That was the ending she wanted to have happen. And she, I think that essentially that was... Well, I don't know if that sums up all of the work she made during her whole life. It wasn't always, like, wishful thinking. But um, I think that's a big function of being able to do this kind of memoiristic work is to create understanding. Well, I know Susceptible took her a long time to make. Yeah. And that was that seemed like at the time, as mo- amongst the published works, her most autobiographical, true depiction of something. Even Definitely. though every everyone has a different name, um, and it's about her, her kind of rough upbringing. But how long did that take her to do? I can't remember <clears throat> when she officially started it. She she was talking about it a lot. I think it's probably even before I met her. I think she had made contact with Chris from Drawn and Quarterly, and he, had, she, you know, she was from Montreal. They were in Montreal. She was this kind of charismatic teenage mini comic silkscreen punk, and so early on, I think they Chris sort of offered like, if you ever want to do a book with Drawn and Quarterly, we'd love to look at whatever. And so she was in her mind. She had this open door that. I think she carried around for a long time this idea like, okay, I have to make something so good, so meaningful to to work with this great publisher. And it probably took a decade of thinking about that before starting to work tangibly on Susceptible. She had, a, But she did a lot of preparation work in her mind and in her notebooks about it. Anyway... Long answer to your question. I think it probably took about six or eight years of drawing. That's such a big deal. Uh I'm really glad that it's included in here, even though, um, you know, even though it was already published by them and this has so much unpublished or just mini comic independently published content that you mind to put in here. Um, I was so happy to see Susceptible in there too. Yeah, I'm... I was happy to get to put it in there. I like the printing better. I mean, that's like a a detailed, fussy issue, but this whole monograph is published in CMYK. So so get printing black and white illustrations in four colors. It just, the the depth and the richness of there translates a lot better. And the, the blacks in the original version of Susceptible always felt kind of flat to me compared to, I just am used to seeing her originals, which are, a whole other level mm. of detailed and beautiful. So to get to sort of remaster, rescan the originals of Susceptible and print them in full color, yeah. This is, I don't know if people are interested in this level of detail, but I... They are, because <laughs> a lot of cartoonists listen to this, and specifically my comic students, just I make one of my friends yell at them about RGB versus CMYK. Uh-huh. And so it's really on top of mind. Well, yeah, I mine too. I love this, that stuff. And um, sometimes I wish I wasn't so fussy about printing quality, but I do notice it. I, I like making books and I notice, you know, more patterns and whatever else. It's, it was really, I'm, I'm happy with how this book turned out. It was amazing to get to make it at the scale that we got to make it. Well, so I guess I want to know, how did your, did your relationship to Jean Viev's work change over the time that you knew each other? And then did it change more when she was gone? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it has. I wonder, it always has felt like a thing that sort of, it wasn't my thing. It was her thing. She, it was her thing that she was working on. I... Um, could relate to it in the sense of it like had this central devotion in her life and that's how I feel about the things that I work on um, but I always felt like a spectator I guess or, or like on the sidelines watching this thing unfold and seeing the different phases it went through I mean there's so many aside from just like drawing comics 
She spent a lot of time, and it's represented in the monograph, doing more gallery-oriented stuff or like sculptures or one-off kind of half sculpture, half painting, illustration things. It was... Yeah, I think one big change was over the course of knowing her, my understanding of what she did shifted from you're a cartoonist to, oh, you're a painter. You just make like really tiny paintings that are so detailed and happen to be printed in like affordable, commodifiable comic book forms. But these things need to be seen like on a wall. The originals are so crazy as paintings. I think more so than than other seeing cartoonists originals typically it's it's always amazing but i've i've seen a bunch and sometimes it's like oh yeah okay that like peanuts strip original looks like more or less how it looks in the newspaper <laughs> but she she just added a lot of extra effort a lot of they're tiny little um full spectrum paintings it's i i own one of them that i got from a French gallery show in, I guess it was 2015 or early 2016, and I still can't figure it out. Hmm. Like, I still can't believe how, like, I can look at the actual thing this close to my face, and I still can't completely understand how everything is so small. Yeah. How everything is so precise and so small at the same time. And also, I can't believe that her neck didn't look like a goose from, like, how much, like, hunching she had to do yeah. that I've seen in photos of her drawing. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Not a sustainable <laughs> um, physical position. I don't know. She probably, she did go to acupuncture a lot, actually. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I'm with you. I don't get it either. Her little tiny brushes with, like, one hair on them. <laughs> It's really a beautiful, it feels very old fashioned and I can't tell from what time. Yeah. But there's something about it, like the, the painting with like the tiniest, the tiniest little like whisker that's in a brush holder. Uh-huh, exactly. It, it, it just feels very ancient. Yeah, I think about it in that way too. That was a, at some point I started thinking about it like, oh, you're like one of these obsessive monks that just does these sand mandalas or you're like whoever paints like ukrainian easter eggs or like these super detailed almost like spiritual practices that don't make any sense in the rational world um but there's this devotion aspect to it that where it does make sense it makes perfect sense um and then as she was getting sick it seems like her practice changed you know she started working on the book a bubble and she started kind of trying to draw um, not I don't know if she was trying to draw her way out of her situation of illness but things got a little more trippy and I know mm -hmm. that before then she had been I know that you know she was known as being very I don't want to say idealistic but very in her ideals in her punk politics in her sure. very grounded earthly ways can yeah. you talk a little bit about the, I don't know, the the things that were very important to her in life, the things that she felt she stood for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I maybe have come to think of that idealism as a, a reaction to growing up in sort of a chaotic situation, like with where the adults around her were inconsistent in their like sense of right and wrong and boundaries and you know safety and stability for a little kid she probably had like a natural inclination towards being um uh ethically rigorous or something but yeah i think it just even got exaggerated by that young upbringing in chaos she she got fixated on standing up for her clear sense of ideals and like making sure everyone around her knew that's wrong or, that's right that's good but that's bad and <laughs> like yeah having everything was black and white pretty much like she had a tendency to divide things up and not really do middle path <laughs> arguments which is maybe my natural tendency that's usually our like arguments with each other were usually along those lines 
I was too wishy-washy and she was too extreme. But um, what you ask, what did she actually stand for? I don't know, the usual stuff. Like, <laughs> 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 like don't torture, don't, um, don't ruin earth, <laughs> don't, don't George W. Bush. <laughs> yeah. It's like, a, like an she, anti-capitalist kind of punk. For sure, yeah. Yeah, like Montreal punk scene, um, anarchy, kind of, you know, she was a teenager with like crass patches and subhumans tapes and orthodox punk ideals and like crazy hair just to freak out the normal people that ran her school. (laughs) And then she got a job at the punk clothing store in Montreal and selling whatever, piercing stuff. (laughs) <laughs> that that version of punk was sort of the world she came from and she would joke about it a lot of course later it's all it's such a funny costume and also the ideals are real yeah so yeah they she didn't she softened up for sure and like let in more nuance but she remained at, in at her heart like anti bullshit for sure. I guess that's the main ideal. It's like calling people out if they were doing any bullshitting at all. Really f- fixated on like authenticity and sincerity. Hmm. Um, and then how did that shift into the mystical? Because I see, you know, in the book towards the end, there's a lot of kind of almost like prayer in it of just trying to like, you know, trying to accept love, trying to like speak to her body or through her body. And then also making these, um, the cards. Yeah. Yeah. I know it was a pretty pronounced pivot and it was disorienting at the time for me, just how, how kind of, I don't know, new agey or, or, um, superstitious, supernatural. She sort of leapt into that world after she got this bad cancer diagnosis and it was unpredictable that 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 happened and I didn't really know how to make sense of it for a while then she was like Phil come on I've been superstitious this whole time and then in retrospect I would start to see like oh yeah you you do have all these like a little bit OCD things of you I don't do this this has to be this way there's like this kind of supernatural or superstitious conception of the world that was always sort of threaded through the black and white punk idealism so she yeah it was always in there I think she just really blossomed when she needed some more like systems of understanding to grab onto to make sense of this crazy mortality thing yeah um well, it's really beautiful to see, and I can't remember, what do you call the card deck? It's not tarot well, cards, per se. It's not tarot, yeah, I don't totally, Richie actually... The Tectonic Deity tarot. Oracle Deck. Yeah, it's an Oracle Deck, which I guess is a different type of thing. But, um, yeah, it's based on this one, uh, I guess maybe it's kind of famous in that micro world, a different Oracle Deck that's called, I think, the Secret Dakini. And it's done in a similar style of like collage art. So she she was inspired by that and made this little deck in a very small amount of time. Like a couple weeks, she just had these magazine scraps and turned her room into like a hamster den of sh- <laughs> shredded up little pieces of paper. Just a, a floor of shreds. Pretty much, yeah. With just a little wheel for exercise in between shredding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So once jean passed and you had her den of shreds and of drawings and of unfinished drawings, where did you even begin? And what did you have conversations before she passed away about what she would want done with things or what her greatest hope was for her work? Yeah, a little bit. Like I said, she wasn't really into talking about the fact that she might die or that she would die. 
and even though those of us around her probably had a clear sense of what was happening she she was needed people to get on board with like don't talk about it um she's gonna have a miraculous recovery or whatever so we were all doing that for her but at the same time sort of quietly I at least for me I was thinking okay what what's happening here and how can I how can I make it be less chaotic or something I don't know it's just like a autopilot part of me that kicked in to just like organizational brain and so I did recognize before she died that there's some art that um, has will have questions around it that will die with her like the answers will go away so I there was a little bit of gentle question asking like when was this from <laughs> she could tell what I was doing <laughs> but still <laughs> yeah that I did a little bit of jotting down notes on the backs of things like this is from this year this art show because she didn't really keep much of an effort or, or m- much of a organization she just kind of produced stuff and piled it up and kept drawing. Um, but yeah, she did also say about her art that she didn't want, she just said sell it all. She was like, don't, she didn't want to be a uh, a looming presence, like a weird pressure over our daughter of like this kind of huge ghost mom presence that was so heavy and sad and just, yeah she wanted it to just be like light which is what I would want to not light but you know like um she didn't want like a huge brass life-size statue of her plonked down in the middle of the living room <laughs> she wanted us to get to live without a burden of that type of thing so she she did say, like, sell all the art, get rid of it, make sure that this book, uh, Bubble, gets made. Mm-hmm. And um, Did she know she wanted Anders to finish it? No. I think oh. she thought she was going to finish it. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, she, she, um, she was working on it, like, probably the day before she died. She, eventually that last day, she, like, couldn't stand up. She had to be... Uh, lying down she hated that but um oh she did say don't sell that one she said that one was keep keep those originals but i i actually haven't sold them i still have all the originals and i am still thinking about what to do next because now this book exists now Mm -hmm. i feel like they're they're in the world and so it's time to sort of make a decision she wanted me to sell them, but that's intense. That's a or lot. I don't, it's a lot, and also I feel like there's a lot of power to having the co- the collection whole. Yeah. I mean, I think you probably have other things that you're doing with your time, but if you just had a tiny museum, it would be so beautiful just to see all these things in person. That's and to true. get to have the little magnifying glass and look at her lettering and be like, I don't even understand what tool she used to do this thing that she did. A tiny museum would be ideal. Um, Maybe someday that will just happen somehow. Sagittarius Matters listeners, if any of you are somebody with an endowment for a museum and some people to put it together, (laughs) put that out into the world. Yeah, hit me up. (laughs) So how did you decide what went in and what didn't go in? Mostly I decided it goes in. Mostly yeah. it's like comprehensive. There, The outtakes are like maybe things that didn't uh, express her artistry that much. Maybe if it was mostly a letterpress poster or whatever. It's um, And then there were a lot of notebook pages. She had all... I included a lot of notebook scans, but there, there were hundreds of notebook pages. And originally I thought maybe... We could do a separate book that's just all the notebooks. Mm. But, and that still might happen. I have to, it's possible that that would be like too personal. It would be too much of a betrayal of her like private thoughts. Because, yeah, there's lots of journal stuff in there. And she actually didn't want to publish those things. I, I was always like, oh, these pages are so beautiful. You should just publish this. 
she's like, no, this is just my sketches. This is just for me. But they're so beautiful, the notebooks. And I, I personally love seeing uh, how things get made, the development of an idea from, yeah, all the sketches to the final product. I really so love I didn't it. So leave out a lot of notebook pages and, yeah, it's just intuitive mostly. I bet I left out about 25% of the stuff. What do you think she would think of the book? I think she would like it. I think she would probably also be like, oh man, you shouldn't have shown that. Or that was garbage. That that thing that you actually literally snuck out of my garbage. Because yeah. <laughs> I would, I had a secret collection. And I still do of like little scraps of paper from her, her recycling bin. That um, I could do a whole nother book actually of just her grocery lists. They're so beautiful. <laughs> like <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of these grocery lists. Oh my God, I would read those any time. And I'd also be like, what kind of food was she buying? Oh, Yeah, it was the same thing over and over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like hippie food too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I do want to do something with them someday. I have had the experience of house sitting for a friend who's recycling bin, who was also an illustrator, who's garbage. I was like... I can't steal your garbage, but I want to steal your garbage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it's beautiful. (laughs) I know. Yeah, she, I mean, of course, the art, being the artist of the thing, you perceive it differently and you want to put your best thing into the world and another person is going to have a different, they're going to draw the line in a different place about what's beautiful. But that's mostly what I think she would make of this monograph is, like, wow, it's so beautiful, and I'm so flattered, and geez, all this attention just for me. But also, so many scraps that you shouldn't have put in, she would have probably think. I feel really happy the scraps are in there. Me for too. What Those are for. actually my favorite part, but that's just my taste. They're wonderful, and I love the tiny di- diary comics. Mm-hmm. The tiny tour travel comics. Yeah, I know. Those are always, I mean, I think she even knew these are the... These are the hits. Like, this is what people want to read is the straight up, like, autobiographical, funny, like, I'm walking down the street, I tell a funny joke, oh, I stepped in poop, oh, and then, you know, like, the dirty plot style. Yeah. It's, like, juicy to read. Um, and it's not, like, metaphorical or obtuse or or philosophical too much. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just, like, it's, like, a lovely breather to get to see the complexity of her as an artist Mm -hmm. to get to see like, okay, here's my life's work. Here's like an illustration that's going to go on my record cover. Here's a diary comic. Here's my childhood. Here's me as a witch grappling with feminism. (laughs) Yeah. There are a lot of facets. I was, I was asking, um, different frequent friends to the show, um, about this interview and friend to the show, Beth Pickens wanted to know, how do you how did you manage your grief while you were managing her artistic estate? It they work together those two projects. I think working on this book over the course of the last 5 years. Oh, also by the way, I didn't really totally answer. It was after she died like immediately that I focused on organizing this stuff. I got like nice big plastic binders and just sorted it through. It was actually a really useful way of like caring for the aspect of her. I think it did a lot of grief work for me was to like lovingly make sure these things are protected and like writing down the date and the title and putting on a little sticker and just like commemorating them. And it felt like holding on to some aspect of her. Um, I I was grateful that there was so much of it for me to do that with because I spent, I had a friend come over pretty regularly and we like made a spreadsheet and we had this whole system of cataloging yeah like the the whole history and interlocking this did this appear anywhere was it published what was the date blah 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 measurements i i dove into that archiving work and it, it helped with the grief and then the same applies to putting this book together which happened a little bit later maybe a couple of years later i started taking those those like 
folio books and scanning the originals and photoshopping them. I would do it like at night after my daughter went to bed and it felt like hanging out with her in a way. Like, oh yeah, with Geneviève, I mean. Like mm -hmm. going going back to focus on this work and polish it up. It was all part of like a long and gentle grief process. It seems like such a lovely a lovely process. Yeah, it I mean it was. It it's a process that has to happen one way or another and I think maybe mm -hmm. lots of people who grieve cobble it cobble the process together from like whatever they have and I feel like having this visual art to focus on it, I'm so grateful for it it functioned it, it, as like a grief vessel in a really tangible and pragmatic way yeah and how does it feel now that it's out into the world so good it feels like finally this book that well, yeah, another aspect of all this is when she was alive, she was always a little bit like struggling, like hung up on like dissatisfaction with the amount of or the type of recognition she would get. And it was always, she was always a little bit like, oh, man, another like article about me where it says that I'm the wife of this like more popular musician guy, me, which and like how how annoying that was and how like misogynistic it was and um and then not only that but even when I wasn't mentioned just like she would work so hard on this stuff and then her book would come out and it would be like okay some people liked it I think but I don't even know I think it wasn't like fun enough <laughs> and just <laughs> um she struggled a lot with her her feeling of being like overlooked I think it, yeah. while she was alive it, she didn't have an easy time with it and so yeah. it feels good to have this book out to be like okay everyone look, check out who this person was and what she made like it feels like it's all in one place it's all like as beautiful as it can be and it's um so satisfying to like make the big effort to a little yeah like it would be cool if it could happen when she was still alive but that at least now people can see, like, no, really, this was kind of a, a crazy, amazing, gifted artist. Today's episode is brought to you by Laura Perry, Jamie Rabin, Jennifer Astion, Shoshana Ruth Wechter, and Joey Soloway. If you would like to support Sagittarian Matters, in particular, producer Chris Sutton, please send $5, $5 million, that's your business, via PayPal to hornetleg at gmail.com. Or, this just in, he's got a Venmo, Hell Books. That's H-E, double hockey sticks, books, on Venmo. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to saying your name on the podcast. Producer Ponyo looks forward to it too. Don't be scared. That's just Ponyo's speaking voice. Mariana Ritchie is a professor, a musician, and the author of the book Composing Capital Classical Music in the Neoliberal Era. She's an old friend of mine and a longtime friend of Jean Viev's. Towards the end of her life, Jean-Viev Castray created an oracle deck from collaged magazines, and Richie was listed as one of her collaborators. If you get the new collected book from Drawn on Quarterly, which I hope you do, you'll see little bits of Richie sprinkled all around. In diary comics from when they toured together in Australia with Richie's band Lloyd and Michael, or in lists, or with the oracle deck. I invited Richie to come and chat with me about the oracle deck and about her memories of her friend, my favorite artist. Please enjoy my talk with friend to the show, Mariana Ritchie. Mary 
Anna Ritchie. Welcome to Sagittarian Matters. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to see you. It's great to see you. We used to be neighbors. Mm -hmm. You lived in Little House where I also lived, but I yes. lived up the street from Little House. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was just thinking the other day about how when we moved in, you left a bottle of champagne in the fridge and I thought it was so fun and fancy. That is fun and fancy. It's nice of you. Oh, great. <laughs> I'm happy to. There's so many things people tell me that I'm like, I don't remember that, but it totally tracks. Yeah. And I feel yeah. very happy that that happened. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, Little house has since been demolished. The land itself was sold, what, or that they built like a gross townhouse there and it sold for $500,000, which at the time seemed like $3 right. million. Right. Now I bet it will sell for $3 million. Yeah. Um, you're here today. Sorry, I'm, I'm feeling very jovial just because I'm excited to see you. That's great. Well, you're here today. I wanted to talk to you. Um, this book, jean Viev Castres, Full Collected Works, has just come out with Drawn and Quarterly. And I talked to Phil for the podcast. And I also wanted to talk to you for the podcast because you were close with jean Viev, And not only that, but your collaboration, your collaborative work is reflected here. <laughs> it's funny because I didn't really do very much you know, in the making of that deck. And if you knew her, you knew she was extremely particular and extremely actually not in this in, in when it came to her art, at least within our relationship, not super collaborative. But I was helping her. I was there at that time at, at the end of her life when she was I, I was sort of like um, an amanuensis. I would sort of cook for her and take dictation and, um, you know, fetch things for her uh, during the kind of like last two weeks of her life. And one of the things she was interested in was making that deck. And it was so cool because it was so different. It, it like, it looks so different from the rest of her work. It was this kind of like new direction that she was cutting up, um, like an in-flight magazine and making these incredible, like resonant symbols and, and putting images together. And, uh, because she had gotten really into tarot decks and Oracle decks and stuff, which is a shared interest of ours. So that was the capacity in which I was helping. She was like putting them together. And then um, the place where I came in was she had a stack of them that she didn't know like what what they were actually symbolizing, you know, the title, like what should this one be about? And we would kind of throw ideas back and forth and I would take notes and stuff. But I had forgotten until I just got the book too shortly after you and I were texting about it. And I had totally forgotten until I looked through that part of the book that the main reason that she wanted me to be involved was because she wanted to say, Marianna Ritchie, PhD. She wanted PhD to be on, on, the, on the deck. Like <laughs> she thought it, she thought it made it sound like professional and also funny that it was like a, a scientific or, you know, that an academic had like signed off on it. And I totally forgotten that until I looked through and saw that in her notebooks, she had kept, she was like experimenting with how our names should be listed. Uh, oh, like really? On, yeah. Yeah. I had no funny? idea. I saw your name throughout in like places, you know, like with like a unicorn or she's like, here's a list of people to play tricks on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was sweet. Um, it was really sweet to encounter some of that that stuff in that form. The book is so beautiful. It real. I was really. I can't believe it. I'm so. I was so happy to see it. It's so beautiful, and it's really obviously since Phil's the one who made it, but it just so it captures so much of her and what she was like, and it's such a loving vision of her. You know, like I was really struck by how the the recurrent image of her at her desk you know is is throughout and he's so affectionate it was clearly such a huge part of her and and their relationship and um and it's true when i think of her i picture her hunched over that desk <laughs> it was like an altar i think he calls it an altar i was always surprised that she hunched because i just know that really ends up hurting your hurting your back at a certain point her posture at her desk was very painful looking she it was a st it was like at standing desk level and she had this like tall um stool that was not ergonomic at all and she would kind of like perch on it or like one leg off one leg off on and and hunch it was intense 
she I was have like a, one with the desk. I have a friend who I ended up taking a picture of this, but I went to a friend's house who is also like a very prolific cartoonist who you would think would like think a lot about his posture. And he had a stool with a cushion duct taped just to the top of like a wooden stool. <laughs> and that was his thing. <laughs> That's so funny. I wonder if it's a cartoonist thing. What's your setup like? I have an Aaron chair. Yeah, you take it really seriously. Well, because my hand fell apart after I finished calling Dr. Laura and I couldn't do anything with it. And so then I was like, oh, I got to make some changes. Yeah, yeah. That's how I feel. I'm, I sit at my desk too for bit because of typing. And I'm like, at some point, I have to radically reconfigure this because I can tell I'm doing damage to my skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, she did a lot of yoga and stuff. Maybe she maintained in other ways. Mm. I don't know. Well, I, I guess I, I wonder, I know that you at different points, um, you noticed her work ethic, or that's something that we've talked about, mm -hmm. is her practice and her work ethic, even up until the end of her life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was so into work. It was a huge part of her personality and her identity, I think, was to be she just loved working and she she was always working she always had ideas she was always working on 18 different things at once even through the you know horrible final months of her life when she was also i mean that was a that was a kind of practice too i think looking back um you know she was doing so much research into uh along so many different paths some of them were um kind of pretty kooky and and extreme but it was it became it was just such a huge part of her daily activity she would work at her desk and she would just sort of like work to keep herself alive and it she it she would say things like if she stopped it would be like giving up or you know it, it was some it was obviously the thing kind of anchoring her um throughout her life and then it continued anchoring her as she died she was still working up until the day before she died at the time when you know hospice people had said that she would probably be bedridden she was still hunched over her desk working on that final book about her baby yeah i think there's a photo of something around that time in the book with her with her um, breathing tubes in hunched yeah. over her desk yeah she would just sort of drag her breathing tubes around <clears throat> but still always working it was intense. Um, there's another part of the book where you appear in a diary comic from a time when you went on tour together to Australia. Yeah. I guess because you had a friendship over many years, is there anything that you wish people knew about jean Vievre or things that felt really, um, I don't know. Yeah. Things that, things that felt like crucial to understanding who she was as a person or things that feel really beautiful to share. Well, a lot of it, I mean, Phil obviously knew her 8 billion times better than I did. And I think that he captures a lot of what I would probably say as well, like in his introduction. Uh, but it, I think if people do, who didn't know her, probably some things that were true about her come through in her work. So like she was obviously very intense and very focused and very precise. Um, and you learn a lot about her from, you know, reading her stuff over the years. But mm, maybe one thing, something that if you didn't know her, you might not be aware of was how silly and funny she was. She is one of the silliest people that I've ever known. She could be so dark and so intense and so ferocious. And then at the same time, she loved fart jokes and <laughs> um, goofing off and just being silly. And I don't know, maybe that does come through. What do you think? Does that come through in, in her like autobiographical comics? I mean, just a little bit, not, not so much. I mean, not as much as I think I've heard you guys say. Yeah. She was super goofy, total goofball. And yeah, that Australia trip, we, we laughed so much. Um, I think in the book, it's the section where we're playing Pictionary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just were screaming, laughing. I can't even remember why, but it was one of the hardest I've probably ever laughed. I feel so happy that it was in there. I love I seeing your a drawn version of you in there. <laughs> I know. I know. It's so cool. I've, I've never been able to draw and, and being around 
her and, and you and other people I know who can, it's like, I feel this longing because it's such a cool way to, to like put your memories down on tour in Australia, to be sketching things that are happening. It was, it, it helps you sort of, it seems like it helps you remember different aspects than just writing. It really does. It's really, it's weird. It feels like an expedient way to like describe an experience. But then when you're doing, you're like, oh my God, this is taking forever. Right, right. Yeah. Where I'm like, I don't, wanna, I don't want to spend two paragraphs describing a room. I'm just going to draw the room. And then it takes you like so much two, longer, two hours to draw the room. <laughs> but you're capturing different dimensions of it mm -hmm. than you can in the writing. Um, and you're, I think you must also notice things obviously, because you're looking at the world with a draw drawer's eye. <laughs> I mean, you are. It's like, um, you know, like there's different things I think, like I, whenever I think about Kyle Field, I think about how giant his nostrils are because all I do is draw people's faces. So I'm always looking at people's faces Noticing and like things. thinking about things like their nostril size. Totally. Like what, what the thing is that I could draw that would be the shorthand to say this is who this person is. <laughs> Yeah, you're like a caricaturist or an impersonist, or like a impressionist. <laughs> what do you want, a tennis racket? You got a big <laughs> chin and a tennis racket. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Look, it's you. <laughs> I remember getting a caricature done when I was a kid and being so sad. That, however, I can't remember how it looked. I must have been drawing or something in it, but I just was like, it doesn't look like me at all. Yeah, they're hurtful. It's funny that they're such a thing. They're <laughs> well, actually weird. really hurtful. But then the person's doing it to be like, hey, isn't this funny and fun? And now you got some to remember this moment. And it's like, you're always traumatized. Yeah, and everyone carries that trauma forever. Like then forevermore, you're uptight about your nose when you were You're like, is that, what it looks, is that what it looks like? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, she, I loved, I loved seeing those, that tour diary. That was really, really fun and funny to remember that. I remembered so much looking through that stuff. I didn't right. realize that the book was going to have all of, you know, her private papers and, and her notebook and stuff. I thought that was really lovely. I did too. It felt so intimate and it mm -hmm. felt like it was appropriate at this time mm -hmm. to have that intimacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was like a, it's like a, a gift. It's a little window into this person that people are so interested in and, get, you know, getting a little bit more of her than you would get just from being, just from reading what she published Yeah, or listening to her music. Yeah. Um, will you tell me, like, what is a tectonic deck? How is it different than a normal tarot deck? Uh, it's an oracle deck. It's an or like, what is the difference between a tarot deck and an oracle deck for people I, who don't know? I believe, and I hope I don't get in trouble because I'm actually not an expert, despite her wanting to put my PhD on the. <laughs> this is what you got your PhD in, right? <laughs> um, uh, uh, as I understand it, an oracle deck is sort of. Um, like the tarot deck is very, it has a hierarchy and a story, you know, it's numbered and, um, and there's suits and there's, you know, hierarchies within the suits. And as I understand it, the Oracle deck is a little bit more open and it's kind of meant to um, like trigger associations that just come to you. I don't know that there's as many like set ways of using an Oracle deck, like the Celtic cross, you know, spreads that you do. I could be wrong, but I think of the Oracle deck as, as promoting a kind of more open-ended like investigation. Whereas with the tarot, you know, cards have kind of specific mean, meanings in relation to each other more mm -hmm. so maybe. That's how I think of it. And she was really adamant that it be an Oracle deck, even though a lot of the cards in it clearly like come from the world of, of tarot. And then what's the tectonic part? I don't know why she wanted to call it that. Hmm. Wait, because I'm really, see. I'm really happened. wondering, like, if one could use this exact deck that's in this beautiful. I don't know if you would actually cut it up with scissors out of this book. I think you would maybe photocopy it, but uh -huh. if one could just use this deck, yeah, I think you absolutely could. She intended it to be that way. Um, wait, what did you just? Say? Oh, tectonic deity. See, I have, I still have my notebook that from when I was being her secretary and and taking helping take care of her. Um, and I, I thought maybe I had, would have written, yes. So 
on this one page where I'm going through and kind of writing down some of the ideas we were coming up with for what each what the cards would be named. I've written tectonic deity oracle and I've underlined it. But then on the next page, I've written secret Dakini oracle, which was another name that I think that she was playing with. And I can't remember where those came from or or what they meant. I have no, I'm sorry, this is like terrible guesting. I can't, I have no memory attached to either of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Tectonic deity. I don't know if she was thinking about the earth and animal spirits and stuff. I would like to employ you to write a book to go along with the deck. <laughs> no, I wouldn't presume. <laughs> that was the thing. I like, I don't feel, I don't feel like I had access into her process. I wouldn't. I would feel like that was presumptuous. Wait, but do you want to see? Here's this Oracle deck she was really, really into from the 80s. Look how big the cards are. Um, Ooh, what's that? Synergy. <laughs> Wait, is this podcast visual? It's not, is it? No, but we could put something up. <laughs> she loved this. And it's very 80s. And see how it's the same um, collage technique of like cutting, cutting up. This was the inspiration. What's it her. called? Oh God, I can't remember what this one's called. It's famous and I don't have the case for it anymore. Shoot. Listeners, look up 80s Oracle deck collage. Yeah, you'll find it. They're, they're really good. So see how like in a tarot deck, there would be numbers and it would be called like the king of mountains or whatever. Um, and you'd be thinking about like the king in relation to the queen in relation to other stuff. These don't have numbers. They're just titles. And they just have these sort of like evocative titles change. So you would draw, you would draw however many you wanted. You can use them however you want, but you draw it and be like change. Huh? What does that mean for me at this point in my life, et cetera. And then the collages, I guess, are, are supposed to kind of like evoke like thoughts about change not it, it the collage is not it, oracle decks don't all have to be collages that's just what this one from the 80s happened i think it's from the 80s i might be saying a lot of really wrong information on your podcast the, the oracle deck community is going to come forth and be like who is who is this phd after all How dare? i mean honestly <laughs> they wouldn't be wrong well that's that's pretty much all I wanted to know about this. I mean, you actually, you, you've told me so many lovely things about it and you've answered so many questions because I got to this part of the book and I was like, oh, cool. What is this? And I was like, yeah. oh, great. Richie helped with this. Yeah. Well, like I told you, I was so surprised when you texted me that it was in there because I had just kind of, um, right after she died, Phil like asked me, what is this deck? And I sent him everything I knew, like everything I had written down and everything that we, that she and I had talked about. And then I never heard any, I never knew what happened and I didn't know, like, I thought maybe he just put it in a drawer. Um, who knows? Because she had so much voluminous, just so much stuff that could have gone into this book. So I was really so pleased that he chose to put it in the book and put it out into the world because I do think it's so beautiful and so different. You know, it's nice to see this other direction of, of something that she was working on. And, and it, so for me, I got to encounter those cards again and I was surprised it's been years now, you know, since the last time I saw them, but I like remembered them. They were, they're so um, beautiful and evocative. I like remembered, I remembered those images it was great to see them. And I had forgotten about the PhD thing, which she thought was so funny. Well, Mariana Ritchie, PhD. <laughs> Thank you for in, coming in on the podcast. Decks. Thank you for coming and talking about the tectonic deity or Dekini. Great. Secret Dekini. Secret Dekini on here. Um, is there anything else you want people to know? No, just that she was so great. She was a, a beautiful, wonderful totally unique person and I hope everyone will look through this book and just think about how special that how special she was and how much that she put into the world in such a short amount of time that she was here Sagittarian Matters is produced by Chris Sutton with assistance by Ponyo Georges our theme music is composed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs of the band Bouquet thank you for listening and I'll See you next time.